Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. I'd like to thank everybody who gave me feedback on episodes 72 and 73, U.S. Pop Culture 1985 Parts 1 and 2, in which we covered roughly January through August of 1985. Based on your comments, I'm going to go ahead and do this episode covering roughly September through December of 1985, even though the Beach Boy content during this period is going to be kind of light. I hope you'll enjoy it. September, of course, for students means back to school, and for the U.S., at least in 1985, meant the fall TV season was kicking off. And there were a lot of new shows in the fall of 1985. For some reason, there seems to have been a feeling that anthology series were going to make a big comeback. The Twilight Zone was revived, as was Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and probably the most hyped and most anticipated show of the fall was the anthology series Amazing Stories, created by Steven Spielberg. Amazing Stories was broadcast on Sunday nights between two kids' shows, Punky Brewster and Silver Spoons, which were both beginning their second seasons, and right before the revived Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Unfortunately for Amazing Stories, it seemed that most people were tuning into another new series over on ABC, MacGyver, starring Richard Dean Anderson. Steven Spielberg had been promised a two-season minimum for Amazing Stories. NBC ran two seasons of Amazing Stories and then didn't renew it. Also new that fall in another big show was Growing Pains over on ABC on Tuesday nights between two other highly rated shows, Who's the Boss, and Moonlighting. Growing Pains followed the adventures of the Seaver family, who were sort of a cross between the Cosby Show's Huxtable family and Family Ties' Keaton family. It starred Alan Thicke and soon-to-be teen heartthrob Kirk Cameron. Over on NBC on Saturday night, long-running sitcoms Give Me a Break and Facts of Life were joined by two new hit sitcoms, The Golden Girls and 227, starring Marla Gibbs. Between shows, we were watching commercials for some big new items, such as McDonald's McDLT Sandwich, with its giant double clamshell packaging to keep the hot side hot and the cool side cool. Even in 1985, this seemed like an awful lot of styrofoam packaging for one hamburger. Also, there were ads for Bartles and James wine coolers. Wine coolers were the drink of the moment, and Bartles and James were constantly being hawked on TV. Also in September on the 19th, the U.S. Senate began hearing testimony from the Parents Music Resource Center, or PMRC, regarding censorship or a rating system for popular music. Testifying against the PMRC were Frank Zappa, John Denver, and Twisted Sisters D. Snyder. The PMRC had been founded in May of 1985 with the generous financial support of Joseph Coors of the Coors Brewing Company and Beach Boy Mike Love. Three days later, on September 22nd, the Beach Boys, minus Brian, appeared at the first ever Farm Aid concert held at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. The concert had been organized by Neil Young, Willie Nelson, and John Cougar Mellencamp after a suggestion that Bob Dylan had made on stage during the Live Aid concerts that summer. The concert was broadcast live on the Nashville network. The Beach Boys played a set similar to what they'd done at Live Aid, which consisted of California Girls, Surfing USA, Help Me Rhonda, Good Vibrations, and Barbara Ann. On September 27th, the Beach Boys kicked off a fall tour, which was mostly in the South, and on November 16th, they played their last live show of the year at Lake Placid, New York. On October 2nd, film star Rock Hudson passed away due to complications from AIDS. Rock Hudson was certainly the highest profile celebrity to this point to have succumbed to the disease. At the theaters, the big summer blockbusters were still packing them in, things like Back to the Future, but there were also some new releases in the theaters, such as Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando, which was number one for three weeks in October, and Glenn Close and Jeff Bridges in Jagged Edge. Of course, as we got closer to the end of the year, we got the big holiday releases, such as Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd in Spies Like Us, which featured the title song by Paul McCartney, which would eventually go to number seven on the chart, and Rocky IV, the big blockbuster of the season, which was the number one picture beginning December 1st, 1985. Stallone had spent the summer shooting and blowing up Soviet Russians as Rambo. Since it was Christmas time, he went a little easier and just beat up a Soviet Russian. Of course, that Soviet Russian had killed Apollo Creed, so there was that. And, of course, Rocky IV also featured a blockbuster soundtrack album with the number two hit Burning Heart by Survivor and the eventual number four hit Living in America by James Brown. 
Soviet Russians also featured prominently in the film White Nights, starring Mikhail Baryshnikov and Gregory Hines, which opened on November 22nd. Like Rocky IV, the film also boasted a hit soundtrack with two number one singles, Separate Lives by Phil Collins and Marilyn Martin, and Say You, Say Me by Lionel Richie. Oddly, Say You, Say Me is not featured on the White Nights soundtrack album. Apparently, Motown didn't want Lionel Richie's first single after his big breakthrough album, can't slow down to be released on another label. It was only released as a single at the time and was eventually included on his 1986 album Dancing on the Ceiling. Finally at year end we got Oscar contender films such as Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple and the eventual Best Picture winner Out of Africa starring Meryl Streep and Robert Redford. In music as 1985 ended the top 10 album chart had at number one the Miami Vice soundtrack featuring You Belong to the City a number two hit for Glenn Frey in the fall of 1985, and of course, the Miami Vice theme by Jan Hammer, which went to number one on November 9th, 1985. And number two was Hart's self-titled album, which had already had the hits What About Love in the summer of 85, Never in the fall of 85, it would go on to have a number one hit with These Dreams early in 86, and a number 10 hit with Nothing At All late in the spring of 1986. At number three on the year-end chart was John Cougar Mellencamp's Scarecrow album, which had already had two number six hits in the fall, Lonely Old Night, followed by Small Town. It would also have some hits going on into 1986, including the number two R.O.C.K. in the USA. After that, at number four was Barbara Streisand's The Broadway album. And at number five was a band I would have considered least likely to succeed in the electronic big hair 80s a down-home beardy blues band by the name of ZZ Top, which somehow became even bigger in the 80s than they had been in the 70s. Their Afterburner album with its number eight hit single, Sleeping Bag, had been released on October 28th, and at year end, the Afterburner album was at number five. At number six was Dire Straits' Brothers in Arms album. They'd already had a number one hit with Money for Nothing. They were currently having a number seven hit with Walk of Life, and in the spring of the new year, they'd have a number 19 hit with So Far Away. At number six was Stevie Wonder's In Square Circle, largely on the strength of its number one hit, Part-Time Lover. It would also have a number 10 hit early in 1986 with the track Go Home. The album that had started the year in the number three position was still in the number eight position as the year ended. That was Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen, which had entered the top 10 on June 23rd, 1984. It would eventually leave the top 10 on February 1st, 1986. It would spend an astonishing 96 weeks in the top 40, five weeks longer even than Michael Jackson's Thriller album. At the number nine position was Starship's Knee Deep in the Hoopla, which featured the highly reviled number one hit, We Built This City, which reached number one on November 16th, 1985. There would be a second number one hit with Sarah on March 15th, 1986. I'm not sure why We Built This City drew so much venom from so many people at the time. Probably it was because there were fans who remembered the Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship days even, as being a much brighter period, and this is sort of being a middle-of-the-road nothing of a song. It's not as terrible, certainly, as people made it out to be at the time, though it's certainly nothing great to write home about. At number 10 was Tears for Fears, still with their big album, Songs from the Big Chair. Other major albums late in the year included Freddie Jackson's Rock Me Tonight. The album had been released in May of 1985 and finally climbed into the top 10 in the late fall based on top 20 hits such as Rock Me Tonight, Old Time's Sake, and You Are My Lady. September 17th saw the release of Here's to Future Days by the Thompson Twins. Lay Your Hands on Me would go to number 6 in the fall of 85, and King for a Day would become a number 8 hit early in 1986. In October, we got Picture Book by Simply Red. The album would be bigger in 1986 than it was in 1985, with the number one hit, Holding Back the Years, reaching that number one position in July of 1986. But I remember that fall, it was ear-catching to hear an acoustic piano at a time of so many electronic keyboards. 
On October 21st, the Simple Minds released their Once Upon a Time album, which would eventually go to number 10 on the chart. The single Alive and Kicking would reach number 3, and Sanctify Yourself would go to number 14 early in the new year. Power Windows by Rush hit the top 10 late in 1985, and November 27th brought the release of Mr. Mister's big breakthrough album, Welcome to the Real World, with its hits Broken Wings, which would reach number 1 on December 7th, Kyrie would be number one early in the spring of 86, and Is It Love would be number eight late in the spring of 86. And Whitney Houston's self-titled album continued turning out hits. The album entered the top ten in the fall and would be the number one album for 14 weeks beginning in March of 1986. Charday followed up her success from earlier in the year with the November release of Promise with its number five hit single, The Sweetest Taboo. And of course, being 1985, there were plenty more all-star charity releases, including the Steve Van Zandt-led Artists United Against Apartheid release, Sun City. The Sun City single was followed up by a Sun City album, and there was, of course, That's What Friends Are For, with Dionne Warwick, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, and Gladys Knight. This would go to number one in January of 1986. Other significant singles at the time included Eddie Murphy's number two hit, Party All the Time, the number six Election Day by Arcadia from their So Red the Rose album. Andy and John Taylor from Duran Duran had had success earlier in the year as part of Power Station. Arcadia, of course, was the other half of Duran Duran, Simon Le Bon, Nick Rhodes, and Roger Taylor. And of course, no discussion of late 1985 or maybe even the 80s in general would be complete without mentioning Norwegian pop band AHA and their number one single from October of 1985, Take On Me, with its groundbreaking video mixing live action and animation. The song and video are really emblematic of 1985 and really of the 80s in general. AHA's album Hunting High and Low would produce one more hit, The Sun Always Shines on TV, which went to number 20 early in 1986. Hipsters late in 1985 might have been listening to Kate Bush's Hounds of Love album, though this was her most successful album in the U.S., as it featured the number 30 hit single from November of the year, Running Up That Hill. Also released in October was The Replacements' Tim album. And in November, we got Jesus and Mary Chain's Psycho Candy album, featuring its hit, Just Like Honey. Jesus and Mary Chain's sound was described rather flatteringly as a cross between the Beach Boys and the Velvet Underground. Also, hipsters might have been complaining about the dire Cut the Crap album from the two remaining members of The Clash, plus three new guys. Though, if you were really going to go out on a limb, you might have been brave enough to admit that the single, This Is England, really wasn't too bad. There was also the US-only release, Catching Up with Depeche Mode, which had a similar cover and track listing to the UK release, the singles, 1981 to 1985. Following up their number 13 hit, People Are People, from the summer of 85, the US collection featured such Depeche Mode classics as Master and Servant, Love in Itself, Blasphemous Rumors, Shake the Disease, and It's Call to Heart, most of which had been overlooked in the US on their initial release and were now getting a second chance for some attention. Other best ofs from the end of the year included The Car's Greatest Hits, Grace Jones' Island Life, and the giant five-album box set from Bob Dylan, Biograph, which began a very worrying and expensive trend of putting some unreleased material from the vault in with a Greatest Hits package. I was really happy to get the unreleased material, but didn't appreciate having to buy all of these songs over again to get it. Of course, this trend would continue much more as we got into CDs with box sets coming out from practically everybody, sprinkling a few unreleased tracks in to make the fans shell out. The Beach Boys have been guilty of it. I love to get the unreleased material, but really hate to have to shell out for stuff that I've already purchased. A much less auspicious but better value from late 1985 was The Who's, Who's Missing, which had previously unreleased tracks at least mixed in with rare release tracks, B-sides and things like that, which you might not have or certainly wouldn't probably have in the sound quality of this album. 
that's it. Hope you found this interesting. If you remember 1985, I hope this sort of invoked the time period well. If you don't remember 1985, I hope this gave you a little taste of what you missed. Love to hear your comments on this. Please like and subscribe. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next week. Bye.